Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 86. It's the Knife Series where we answer all of your, at least some of your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. And this week we're taking a look at some fast knives and also a little bit at the intersection between hunting and food prep and tactical knives. Shall we get into it? Let's do it. So this is Knife AQ, where we comb through the comments section below these videos and pick out some of the good ones to answer in future episodes. So that's what you have to do if you want a chance to have your question featured in the future. Just drop it in that comments section below. First one today comes from KK4545. Uh, hey DCA, got a question for you and would appreciate input. I'm a butcher slash meat cutter by trade as well as an avid outdoorsman. Because of my line of work, I tend to use a five to six inch boning knife for a lot of small tasks. So here's my question. Is there something similar in a smaller carry friendly version of a boning knife that can be used for outdoors tasks and food prep at camp that can be sharpened or maintained easily? Absolutely. Uh, and it figures the uh, the knife I would ask Thomas to pull from the warehouse as an example of a boning knife is packaged like this, but we'll get the picture anyway. Um, as an aside, I enjoy an, an upswept boning knife personally. Do you like a straight backed or an upswept? Anyway, not important for uh, for the answer here. Absolutely, we can get you something actually very similar with Case from their line of hunting knives. Check this out right here. Well, we've got a couple options basically. Uh, you have the, well, it's just called the Hunter. <laughs> and we've got a classic stacked leather version if you prefer that type of look and a less expensive synthetic handled version, orange rubber right here, which definitely you get more grip from something like that and less weight at the same time. There is something real nice about that classic stacked leather look though, and it is quite comfortable too. But there you go, you've got a five or 5.2 inch blade on this orange synthetic version right here long narrow boning knife profile really is and makes sense as a, a hunting knife that a boning pattern could work very well in that regard. And that's what you see right here. Uh, made in the USA, which is nice, about $48 for this knife. You've got a uh, True Sharp stainless, pretty simple stuff, not gonna hold an edge forever, but you did ask about easily maintained and you're certainly gonna have that here. Hollow grind with a more satin finish, or you can go with a closer to mirror polish with the fancier version of this knife. These are really solid and a really good option for exactly what you're asking. You can definitely do a lot of food prep with this. You're certainly familiar with how a blade shaped similar to this works. I'm sure you can imagine all the stuff you could do with this. Might not be the thing you'd wanna go around batoning firewood with, not with uh, this thin profile and the hollow grind, but Every other uh, camp task pretty much is gonna do a pretty darn good job. It's gonna be very comfortable whittling if you need to do some uh, feather sticks, that sort of thing. Even if the hollow grind wouldn't be my preferred grind for that sort of thing, you're gonna be able to do it pretty darn well with something like this. The sheath is fairly simple as you would probably expect. Just synthetic uh, or nylon with a strap and a retention loop. The fancier version though does come with this really nice leather sheath. So take your pick on what you prefer. Heck, you can probably get both if you want. You probably don't want to do that though. The, uh, the larger knife though comes in, uh, oh, that's the, uh, that's not it. Uh, comes in, that's not it either. Thomas, where's my tab? I don't know. $79 for this version right here. I had it out of order, it's my fault. It's not Thomas's fault, this time. You're always out of order. <laughs> Likely. Uh, so yeah, hope that helps. I think that's exactly what you ought to be looking for. Um, maybe some of the, uh, some fillet knives out there that the problem you get into there though is a lot of fillet knives are flexible, but there are some, uh, some more rigid ones that could be pretty good, but I, I would stick with the case. That'd be, that'd be my first choice for something like that. Next question, Von Paul. What do you think about a fillet knife for self-defense? Hey, it's almost like I segued on that on purpose, talking about fillet knives. Well, long enough timeline, maybe they would line up. <laughs> Thomas couldn't figure out what to say. I couldn't figure out what to say either, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, fillet knife for self-defense, I just spoke about what would be the problem as I see it is, they do this, they're really flexible. 
last thing you want is this blade just bending over or snapping off in a quote unquote tactical situation. And a lot of them are probably a little too big for you uh, for that type of use anyway. This one right here is uh, the Buck Silver Creek, comes in about 30 bucks and it's not one of the larger fillet knives on the market and it's still, you know, six and three eighths of an inch long, pretty large. But when you asked this question, I was reminded of a conversation I had with a, uh, a writer friend of mine who's also a police officer, uh, a knife writer by the name of Tim Stetzer, really great guy. And we had a conversation at one point talking about the idea of a bird and trout knife as a backup tactical knife. Because there, there could be some pretty cool overlap here. Bird and trout style knives tend to come in two relatively distinct types. You have ones that are a little bit broader, but still short, but you have ones that have a blade like this, this long, narrow blade profile. And you have this case small hunter right here coming in about $60 that demonstrates that style of blade. This is where things get a little less cut and dry. You know, if you're talking about this style of bird and trout knife as a self-defense knife, I wouldn't pick this one because you know, you've got a three finger grip essentially on this knife. It is really cool. The blade profile is certainly can be wielded to great effect, but it wouldn't be this particular one I would choose. However, let me show you one that I think kind of perfectly leans into intentionally a bird and trout crossed over with tactical knife vibe. And the cool thing about a bird and trout too, especially in a camp situation, is it's kind of like a pairing knife as well. Like I said at the beginning, we're gonna talk about the intersection between camp, cooking, and tactical. This is where it's at. The RMJ Sparrow, I think, is a perfect example of that crossover. And the reason you have a blade shape like this, right, that I, or the reason that I mentioned the paring knife blade, is that's a style of blade that doesn't go out of, out of fashion, so to speak. It's always useful because it is supremely useful and you get it right here. This knife right here is about 200 bucks. This is a Knife Center exclusive orange and black G10 version, has a nitro V blade, and it's got that bird and trout style, but you've got that nice little pokey, agile, very effective thin blade when it's wielded properly. Three and a half fingers, kind of for me, it's, it's still a smaller grip on this particular knife, but it's a lot more grippy than the stacked leather on this case that I was talking about a moment ago. You've got plenty of ridges there for extra traction and a little bit of a, a shape that does a little bit more to keep it locked into your hand. This thing can be wielded super precisely and super effectively if you know what you're doing. I'm not claiming I do in that, uh, in that tactical regard, but it's such a well-built knife and such a versatile shape. I mean, can you think of any small knife task out there that this knife couldn't do? I don't think so. And for that reason, it gets my nod here. The sheath makes it very easy to carry too. You've got Kydex with two straps set up for horizontal carry. Aftermarket attachments will work with this belt uh, or this sheath as well if you want other options. Just super well put together and decently priced too for what you're getting. All right, next question. And we're kind of building up a theme here. Uh, N Valley says, DCA, I do a lot of small game hunting and fishing with my dad on the weekends, but I work in an environment where any kind of knife gets that oh no reaction. Oh no. Uh, that being said, I love both EDC fixed blades and small fish and game slash bird and trout type knives. I've been enjoying Kershaw's new day shoot caper. I was thinking about stepping up to something a little bit classier. Anything come to mind in the 90 to 175 range that fills both rolls? and can be carried with a low profile-ish and won't totally freak people out in public. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, we gotta avoid that oh no reaction. Um, so here's that, uh, that day shoot caper. Really nice little knife and actually might work for that uh, eh, kind of sort of self-defense uh, thing that we just talked about a minute ago. It's certainly got that nice narrow pokey profile. A little bit less of a finger guard, however. So even though that is a caper, that's not too far off from some bird and trout style things. A little bit. Uh, but here's a couple other options. I'm gonna start with one, uh, I showed this a couple weeks ago actually, from CRKT, the Hunt and Fish from Larry Fisher, which is a knife that at its price point, materials wise, it doesn't set itself apart, but in terms of the fit and finish and the fixtures and the details, 
really sets itself apart from anything else in this $85 price range that this comes in. And this has a little bit more of that shorter, broader kind of bird and trout style knife rather than the long, narrow, skinny style. Such a good knife. Check out the details. We've got orange and black G10, three mosaic pins, red liners, a tapered tang on an $85 production knife. Hello. That is quite a detail right there. You're not usually going to find until you bump up the price range significantly more. And then jimping and some nice file work there on the spine. Really cool look, has a very comfortable feel in the hand. That G10 swells in there quite nicely. The sheath is leather set up for horizontal carry. So that's a fairly low profile carry as far as I'm concerned anyway. Will it get you that oh no look? Well, if any knife gets you an oh no look, this is still gonna get you that oh no look, but at least this is has some ornate qualities to it. It's definitely about as far away from tactical as things get. Maybe an open L would be like even farther away, but you know what I mean. This does not say tactical at all. Certainly classy, very nice knife. Uh, three inch blade, HCR series steel, but again, most of the money here is going in to the awesome details. You're not gonna get a super steel along with all of that at this price point. Really sweet knife. One other option, bump it up a little bit price-wise and a little bit better steel as well. Uh, Boker, and this is not even approaching the top end of your price range either. The Brook is the name of this knife for Boker Plus. This one comes in at 120 bucks. And this is also about as far away from tactical looking as you can get. You've actually got a trout inspired handle there with the, uh, the pin pattern that's going on. All of it G10, red thick liners, yellow G10, other yellows, some blacks in there, like a brook trout after all. And again, this one has a very nice feel in the hand, just like the CRKT we just looked at. No tapered tang, but you do get an upgrade in steel here, VG10 has a high reflective finish as well. Very, very classy, very utilitarian. Both of these blades are gonna be great everyday carry blade shapes. Uh, 2.8 inches on the blade here, high flat grind. It's a full flat grind on the CRKT we just looked at. Really sweet. Maybe this one, there's a few different versions of this one. Maybe I picked the, uh, the brightest one because I found it the most whimsical, but that, would, that does make it a little more visible. There are other versions of this that are more muted that still have uh, a, a whimsical pin pattern going on. Maybe those will be uh, flying under the radar a little bit more, but yeah. Any knife is still gonna get you the oh no in a way, but this one at least uh, is gonna be hard, hard for them to defend that if they, they look a little bit closer. Sheath Kydex comes with a simple J style of clip on the back, but your aftermarket tech locks do work with this sheath for more. Uh, options, an ulti clip would work on this really well to carry either inside the waistband or in a pocket. Great, great option for you. All right, next question comes from Eric Lundquist. Uh, what do you think is the fastest deploying non-auto knife? I recently bought a Spyderco Akuchi and I love the way it snaps out, thwack, with an exclamation point. It got me thinking, what's my fastest knife? And also, what do you think is the fastest knife? And what factors make a non-auto fast? Hmm, interesting question. Uh, so here is the Akuchi. Really cool knife, we haven't looked at this in a while. And I like the, uh, the rounded flipper here on the back rather than a flipper tab sticking out. Still works really well because of the jimping on it. Pretty quick, doesn't strike me as the uh, fastest deploying knife that I've encountered, but I do encounter a lot more knives than most people in this job, pretty cool. No, let's, let's go into this a little bit. What other things make a knife fast? Well, you've certainly got assisted openers like this exclusive Kershaw Leak with an S35VN blade. A spring assist definitely makes a knife faster opening, but it doesn't matter, I guess is my next question. Everything out there these days is really fast, whether it's a conventional flipper, whether it's an axis lock or similar, even a lock back that is a little bit slower is still pretty darn quick. Does this, does this distinction matter? I'm not sure, but I'm gonna delve into it a little more, I think. Uh, you, you ask um, what are, sorry, what factors make a non-auto fast? I'm gonna go ahead and say the actual opening mechanism is 
the least part of what makes a knife fast because there are so many other things that get into it. And I think the amount of time it takes to bring a knife, a pocket knife to bear into a cutting position from your pocket goes into what makes a knife fast. This might be beyond the scope of your initial question, but let's, I wanna talk about it anyway. There are certain factors, certain design factors, such as a tip down pocket clip that could make a knife faster. I mean, certainly the thumb studs on this CRKT CEO are set up in such a way, it's at just the right angle with just the right tension on the detent. Those factors are important so that the blade flicks open quickly. But something else makes this knife fast, tip down pocket clip. When you're coming out of your pocket, it's less movement for your hand to get into a grip. Watch, it's funny as I bodge the opening right there, but there's less adjustment when you pull that out of your pocket to get to an opening position than there would be on a tip up pocket clip, like on this Badlands Vagabond from Civivi. You pull it out, you have to flip the knife around and adjust and reset your grip rather than simply pulling out and resetting your grip. You're kind of eliminating that spin motion. Once you get there, the thumb studs or the flipper on this are just as quick. What about going back into the pocket? That's where something like a crossbar lock has a definite advantage over that assist. Even though the assist is probably quicker on the open, you have to push against the spring to close it. Whereas the axis lock, flick it closed and back to the pocket. And even on something like a lockback, which as mentioned is still plenty fast enough for academic use or for uh, everyday use. Say so that the difference is academic. Those are some interesting academics. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rambling here a little bit. My, my thoughts are a little bit scattered, but let me, let me bring it back. Certain features on that lockback, which is a slower on paper locking mechanism, throw something like that Emerson Wave on it, and we're, we're kind of completing the whole, or, or adding to the whole part of the equation at that point. Pull it from your pocket, have that catch on the hem, and rotate open, and it's already open. You don't have to do another opening method. So that's pretty darn fast too. And indeed, if we're talking about fastest to deploy, that might take the cake as far as folders go. But all of these, at least as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a distinction with very little difference because everything here is fast enough to get to and cut what you need on a day-to-day -day basis without slowing you down, really. It's kind of a, a distinction, I think, that comes more into play when we're talking about a self-defense or tactical use scenario, which it's fun to think about, but it's also fun to, or, or good to make sure we have a healthy dose of reality in our uh, questioning or in our, our thought process as well. Hope that helps. Which brings us to our lightning round for today. John Hurley says, I personally think that Knives for Self-Defense is largely a delusion. Quite possibly so, quite probably so. Um, but it's those, one of those fun things to think about. In my uh, so, so, so many years of carrying knives, I've never used a knife in self-defense, but I've cut a lot of things, so. I've gotten close. Really? Yeah. Care to share with the audience? Yeah, kind of, people cooled off. Oh, okay, that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Was a former bartender, like we said. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, next uh, lightning round question comes from Dmitry Belanovich. Uh, I am considering the bug out for its lightweight and slim design. M390 versus S90V. I'm looking for the best edge retention as I'm opening packages daily. And for me, 440 goes dull in about two to three weeks tops. Or maybe should I just upgrade to the S30V? Well, first I'd say if you're getting two to three weeks of constant daily use out of a 440 blade, it's not bad at all. It's actually pretty good, uh, which says to me you know how to sharpen, which is more almost really more important than steel selection. S30V would be a real easy recommendation to upgrade. You're definitely gonna get a bump up there. If you're talking about the other two steels, the premium options, uh, 280 for S90V and carbon fiber, and I think about 250 for M390 and aluminum on this bug out. Both of them are gonna be several steps up above that S30V as well. You might get frustrated sharpening them though, compared to what you do on your 440, I don't know. But between the two hands, if, if I had to push come to shove, the S90V probably has a little bit of an edge uh, over the M390 on the edge retention front. You may not notice that much difference because it's not as huge a bump up as 440 to S30V is 
in any case. Really, go with, go with whichever handle appears to appeals to you more in this case. That'll be more satisfying uh, day to day than whether you picked the quote unquote better steel or not. But you can't go wrong with either of the steels either. They're gonna do great jobs for you. Now, Mike asks, if you had $100 to spend on a folder and prefer American made, what knife would you recommend? Let's go back and forth just a little bit and I feel like, uh, Kershaw Link in 20 CV blade steel, 93 bucks, thick enough handle and hand filling enough that you could use it for heavier work, but it's not so thick that most folks are gonna, you know, feel uncomfortable carrying it day to day. You've got assisted opening, you've got that 20 CV for great edge retention, excellent slicey blade shape for everyday carry use. Really cool knife, that'd be my pick, but only because they, uh, they stopped making the bare knuckle. I like that knife even better, even though the steel is not quote unquote as good. Bare knuckle's a sweet knife, I'm sad, I'm sad it's gone. Which brings us to our final question, our most serious question of the day, which comes from the scraggly man. Are you the cop from Stranger Things? Yes. That's where he went at the end of season three. Right here. And now it's time for some coffee and contemplation. I'm gonna go that way. Because it is the end of the FAQ for today. Let me know what you thought of the answers down in the comments. Go ahead, take me to task, I don't care. And if you have a question of your own, leave it down there as well, and maybe it'll get picked for a future episode. If you wanna get your hands on these knives, you can find them over at Knife Center via the links in the description below. And don't forget about our Knife Rewards program either, because if you're buying one of these knives today, you might as well be earning some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. And that's Thomas behind the camera. We'll see you next time. I, that's not what I usually say. Nope, but it is what we're gonna close on. Oh, all right then, fine. Bye guys. <laughs>